Hi everybody. So, in case you don't know, I'm not an engineer, I'm actually a chemist. And when you think about chemistry, the chances are is you think about esoteric processes with dangerous procedures and positively lethal chemicals. And, well, fair enough, that is one side of it. Actually, there's a whole other side of chemistry that's really trivial to do and can produce stuff that you need in order to do some pretty exciting things. Copper nanoparticles, for instance, are brilliant when it comes to uh, steam engines and solar power. And there is a whole branch of chemistry called mechanochemical synthesis. Now, with a name like mechanochemical synthesis, you might think that it's a fairly sophisticated method, but far from it. At its core, it revolves around the concept of utilising mechanical force, like grinding, milling, shearing, to drive chemical reactions. And it's quite a departure from conventional thermal or solution-based synthesis processes. And the very nature of it minimises the reliance on solvents and elevated temperatures and can maximise efficiency and sustainability. It's hugely versatile and spans a vast spectrum of applications from pharmaceuticals and material science to organic and inorganic chemistry. A good example is in the development of drugs, where this style of synthesis has proven instrumental in creating compounds with enhanced purity and unique properties. By not using a huge amount of solvents, this approach addresses environmental concerns while streamlining the synthesis of complex molecules. The field of material science benefits significantly from this style of synthesis as it enables the production of diverse materials ranging from metallic organic frameworks to nanomaterials, polymers, ceramics and composites. And they quite often exhibit exceptional properties such as improved porosity, increased stability and enhanced catalytic activity which opens doors to applications in gas storage, drug delivery, sensing technology and more. One of the remarkable aspects of mechanochemical synthesis is its ability to induce reactions that are otherwise challenging or impossible to achieve using traditional methods. Mechanochemical activation can break down kinetic barriers, facilitating reactions at lower temperatures and at shorter time scales. This not only expedites the process of synthesis, but also allows for the creation of compounds with very different structures and properties, often unattainable by conventional means. The process is actually intriguingly dynamic because mechanical force in itself is acting as a catalyst, initiating reactions by promoting molecular collision and rearrangement. The energy imparted by the mechanical action triggers the breaking of chemical bonds, enabling atoms and molecules to recombine in new configurations. The dynamic nature of the method is constantly pushing the boundaries of what's available and what's achievable and what can be done in a laboratory setting. Moreover, the eco-friendly nature of the synthesis aligns with the growing emphasis on sustainability in scientific endeavours. It's all part of the paradigm shift that we're now referring to as green chemistry. As the realm continues to evolve, propelled by advancements in technology and new methodologies, its potential is vast and largely untapped and very approachable to the home chemist. It's efficient, sustainable, and cost-effective, and revolutionise the way we conceive of products and materials and compounds that are critical to various industries. In essence, it's a frontier that is open for everybody to explore. So one of my mo um, favourite, most favouritest techniques in chemistry is mechanochemical synthesis. Now mechanochemical synthesis, even though it sounds great, is really, really easy. All you do is subject a reaction mechanism to some mechanical force over a long period of time. That's all it is. What we're going to do is we're going to take some chemicals and we're going to chuck them in this thing, turn it on and leave it grinding for a day or two, something like that. This thing is an Indian spice grinder. Uh, it's for wet spices. I've showed it before, but I'll show it again. It's a very simple piece of equi kitchen equipment you can buy for oh, a couple of hundred pounds, something like that, but astonishingly useful. And what it is, is a um, spindle with a couple of granite stones on it, stainless steel case and a granite in the bottom. That granite turns around on that central spindle. As it turns around, those stones rotate and anything in there is subject to um, a shear force, a low impact shear force, and that can be absolutely awesome because materials in contact under those conditions will react. And those mechanically applied conditions is what mechanochemical synthesis 
is all about. Now you can use this to make lots and lots of things and what we're going to use it to make are some copper nanoparticles in copper format because they're just astonishing. You can get the copper nanoparticles out really easily by dilution. Just dilute it, you get a solution of copper format and all the copper nanoparticles will sink to the bottom in a nice salmon pink colour. And you can make tons of it. Instead of making a few micrograms using wet synthesis, with this you can make absolute grams of that material. The resultant material that comes out of here is the stuff that we use to copper plate stainless steel just by rubbing it on the stainless steel. So it's an awesome material just for applying with a, a rag to copper plate surfaces in an adherent copper plate. That copper plate will happen with iron, but it's very flaky. With this and the nanoparticles in the format, it adheres and gives a shiny copper plate. And I'll demonstrate that at the end of the video. Now all we're going to do is chuck some copper oxide in there and some formic acid. So word of warning, this formic acid, this stuff is um, 85% and it is not nice stuff. It's a very powerful lacrimator. That means if you take the top off and give that a good sniff, you're going to fall over and cry for hours. It's horrendous. So do it in a well ventilated area and resist the temptation to go, I wonder if that smells like vinegar because you'll be really, really sorry, okay? So don't do it. Do it in a well-ventilated area or a fume cupboard or wear a mask. Now, I'm obviously here in the studio doing a video for you with the door closed so that we can keep the sound down and Luke working over in the corner. So what I normally do is take a deep breath, yell at Luke, he runs out of the room and I pour it in and just put up with it. It isn't that dangerous, but if you're really worried about it, then like I say, take the proper precautions, mask, fume cupboard, ventilated area, that sort of stuff, okay? Now we're going to use copper oxide in there and we're going to use copper one oxide, which is this red copper oxide. The copper two oxide is the black stuff. This red stuff is the copper one oxide and that will reduce with the, form with the formic acid under mechanochemical synthesis conditions into copper nanoparticles and copper formate. And it's a bright blue colour. Now, common to all mechanochemical synthesis, it takes quite a long time. So it's about a day or two grinding away in here. So I'm going to put this away in the fume cupboard and leave it for a day or two, just occasionally checking on it to have a look. Now, the ratios are four to one. You need one part of your copper oxide and four parts of your formic acid. And in this case, we're going to use 125 grams of the red copper oxide which I've got to put back in so that I can wear this tray. And 500 millilitres of your 85% formic acid. So 125 grams of this stuff. There we go. And you just put it in. And when we've added the acid, you turn it on. And then 500 millilitres of this stuff. Luke, run! <laughs> and I did warn you about the smell. It will get to you after a bit. It's obviously not that crucial because I'm not just not doing anything about it. But it will get to you. So, I'm going to put that in the fume cupboard, turn it on, a day from now, we'll revisit it. Okay, so it's had 24 hours. <clears throat> and if we have a look in there, what we'll see is a really nice blue mix with a kind of um, shot through with a salmon pink. <laughs> Whoa, I did warn you, it does make you cough. <coughs> what we're going to have to do is get that out of there and into a pot. And once we get that sealed up, it's kind of um, safer. At least you can't breathe it in. If you're going to do this, like I say, you're best to do it in a fume cupboard. So I'm going to take this off to a well-ventilated space and get it into this pot. Okay, so after much coughing and spluttering, we've managed to get it nice and safely into this tub. Once it's in that tub and the lid's on, 
there's no real worries. Now, I like that blue colour. I think it's beautiful, actually. But uh, I understand that other people may think it's just a stinky, horrible mess. And why would we bother <laughs> making this material that is just a stinky, horrible mess? Well, this material actually is astoundingly useful. In fact, there are so many uses for it, this video would be hours long if I were to go through those uses. So I'm going to make other videos showing the uses of this and, and exactly how to use it to do some of the tasks that we would want to do. This bit, I'm just going to give a bit of an overview about what it can do. Now, the first thing that it can do is, if you add a bit of water, you'll form this blue um, format solution, that's obviously a copper two salt, and at the bottom you'll see a salmon pink layer. That salmon pink layer are, are copper particles. They're not nanoparticles. Copper nanoparticles are black. Um, this salmon pink tells you that it's quite small, but still in nano terms, relatively large copper particles. But they're still extremely useful. We can decant that off or filter it off, collect those particles, and then you can use them to paint and anneal and make copper traces with them. It's quite a large scale, so you're using a paintbrush and that kind of thing. You're not going to be able to use a printer with it. But you can make copper traces from that um, copper material, which is soft, uh, really, really easily. Now, you just want to you prepare the material when you want to use it, because they are small enough to oxidise quite quickly when they're in that particle form. So you take some of this material, which will keep your copper pure, add some water, decant it off, collect your particles and use them. Now this format here is really useful because under heat it will decompose into carbon dioxide, water and copper. And the heat you need isn't very high, it's about 200 degrees centigrade. It's not, not tremendous. Um, so we can use that copper two salt to make actual nanoparticles, and I'll do one where we make the actual nanoparticles out of it. Now nanoparticles of, uh, for copper are extremely useful, it's what they were using for flash steam, when they did the nanoparticle addition for flash steam experiments. Uh, and we'll go into that and how to make those nanoparticles from this format as well, the real nanoparticles. But the format is also useful for a ton of other things. Now, one thing you can do with that material is you can add an ethanolamine. And this is monoethanolamine, but you can add triethanolamine and it makes this sticky blue material here. And this is obviously a copper complex. And we can use that copper complex to do things like coat a bit of stainless steel. This is a bit of stainless steel lid, and I've rubbed that onto there, and I've got a very light copper coating on there. But we'll go into that with close-ups and how that was actually done, so that we can coat um, ordinary stainless steel with it. And we can use this material, incidentally, to um, give a nice copper coating onto metal finishes. These are supposed to be stainless steel. I don't think they are. I think they're just as steel, to be honest. But if I take a clean bit of that and some of this stuff, actually we'll use this, it's a bit more concentrated. Get a bit on the cloth, give it a rub. There we go. And almost instantly we get a beautiful bright copper finish on that material there, which is nice. So we can use it to cover steels, stainless steels, we can make complexes out of it. Uh, we can make nanoparticles out of it. <coughs> we can use the copper particles themselves. There's a whole host of things we can do. The other thing that I did was I made this organometallic ink out of it. That organometallic ink will go in a normal inkjet printer. And one of the really cool things about that is once you've printed it and dried it... Sorry, I was looking for a piece of paper I had, but uh, I seem to have uh, misled it. Once you've printed it and dried it and you put a spot of this material, it reduces straight back to the copper, so you can print copper lines on paper using a two-pass method, once with the ink, once with the developer, and out comes the copper lines, and we'll do a video on that as well. Another thing you could do with it is you could mix it with, the, uh, with some graphite or some carbon. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, I got a whiff of this. Uh, mix it with some graphite or some carbon, and then heat that to 200 degrees, and you'll form copper nanoparticles or copper nanorods within the graphite or within the carbon. And we'll do that as well and use that material. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. So there's a whole host of things you can do with this material. So much so that putting up with a few coughs while you occasionally get a whiff accidentally is worth it. 
because it's a fascinating, very useful material. And we're going to do some more videos on how to use that material to do some of the things that I've been talking around. Anyway, I hope that was of interest and thank you very much for watching.